All right, guys, I just want to welcome back to the Everything College World Podcast. Today, me and Nick have the Virginia Tech Hokies in the lab. Looking at some of the spring hype that they are getting and why they can be a legitimate contender. Not just to claim the ACC, but to potentially make a playoff run as well. This is a team last year, Nick. I bet the over five and a half wins. I really thought that they would hit that number with ease. And, then, you know, they got off to a one and four start. Incredibly poor. And obviously, I figured this would be a tough little non-conference schedule, but they were just abysmal on really both sides of the ball. The offense scored 17 points uh, three times, and then 16 in the one outlier against Rutgers. The defense didn't look all that great themselves. And then things started to change for Virginia Tech. Grant Wells, he was just abysmal for them, quite frankly. And I believe he ended up going down with an injury, which allowed Kyron Drones, the Baylor transfer, to get the nod at quarterback. And that's when things started to look much better for Virginia Tech. You know, for one, obviously, the schedule got easier, but one could argue it was, you know, equally as difficult, and that's why the improved play allowed them to win seven games. Kyron Drones, you know, he got inserted into the lineup in the losses versus Rutgers and Marshall, throwing the ball 30-plus times. They found great balance against Pitt, though, in a victory. They, you know, were able to put up some nice points or, you know, real breakout performance there for the Hokies. Um, you know, they ran the ball quite well against Florida State. Overall, it was a two and five start, though. Then they won three at the next four, Averaged 530 yards per game in those victories. Got flat out stonewalled in the lone loss at Louisville, though, 140 yards. You know, they had 6.7 yards per play versus a good NC State defense in a loss. And then they ran through a resilient Virginia team on the road for exactly 500 yards. The cash that bet for me. And the punch their ticket to, uh, you know, the postseason, Nick, where they ended up playing, I think it was the Military Bowl against Tulane in a game that they ended up winning with 362 rushing yards in that season finale. The Tulane defense, they allowed 100-plus rushing only like twice over the last two years. So that was an impressive performance, especially in the rain where you knew they were going to run the ball and they couldn't slow it down. You know, the NC State-Tulane games are encouraging to a degree, but when they were red hot and they met Louisville, they blasted them right in the mouth, Nick. That was a stretch for Virginia Tech that they were very impressive in. But obviously, this is a team that's going to have a lot of hype, right? And they are basically held to 10 points against Florida State. They had a kick return for a touchdown that gave them up to 17 That's kind of concerning, though, right? NC State and Tulane, encouraging. But against Florida State and Louisville, the two teams that went to Charlotte for the conference crown, they did absolutely nothing against them. And I think that's the biggest reason why there's going to be caution and concern when it comes to how much this team can accomplish in 24. Virginia Tech is an absolutely fascinating team at the new in the new look ACC, right? You're adding some more talented teams to the conference. The conference is expanding. Virginia Tech, this is a team that has been going through some issues here, and, you know, bringing in new coaches. They ended up bringing in Brent Pry, who I thought was a solid hire when they hired him. This is a team that has a lot of hype in some small circles. Some people are overlooking them. They return a ton of production, which you're going to get into. When you look at last year's schedule, right, 7-5, and five, a pretty respectable record. They put up a great showing in that bowl game against Tulane in Annapolis at Navy Stadium in the Military Bowl, a really strong performance that day on the ground like you were alluding to which is extremely helpful for this team in that loss against nc state they were really solid as well they hung in that game the losses against louisville the loss against florida state against Rutgers certainly are concerning now they were all three of those were on the road you know this team certainly plays very well at home when they have that great home crowd when this team is good it's very tough to play in lane stadium and the whole enter sandman all the energy that comes with that this team is very dominant at home that's why when you look how they did, they won a you know a fair share of games at home. They lost NC State at home and lost Purdue in non-conference at home. But outside of that, they were dominant at home, winning pretty much the rest, winning their rest of their schedule, including dominant dominant performance against Syracuse, against Wake Forest, and schools of that nature. This is a team that I think is figuring it out under Pry. Pry is sort of establishing this run offense that could be really productive for this team trying to get his offense involved he has a great quarterback in drones who i think is a really successful quarterback with a great passer rating this offense and defense as a whole together this unit both units are progressing nicely throughout the spring this is certainly a sleeper team in the new look acc to make some noise you know also this defense really came around you know they dominated in those victories what they did to boston college i thought was highly impressive 262 yards on the road in a game, at least for betting purposes for me, right? They had the win. It was a must win there. 262 yards for an offense that played pretty well throughout the year. Held Syracuse to zero rushing yards. Had 10 plus tackles per loss in wins against Syracuse, Boston College, and then the one over Wake Forest. So they certainly beat up on some of these lower level opponents and they weren't able to kind of replicate that against some of the tougher ones. Um, but like you said, this is a team that's certainly going to continue to progress. They're getting a lot back. You know, we'll go ahead and kind of focus on why they have so much hype. They return a nation high 20 starters. Basically, everyone's back on this football team. You know, on offense, Brayshawn Tutton, another transfer. Him and Drones had 800-plus rushing each. They combined for 312 in that bowl game. Drones was really good for them. This is a player, um, you know, kind of reminds you of Gerard Evans from a couple years ago, 6'2", 234. 
Had 2,000 yards passing, 17 touchdowns, three picks. Only about 160 yards per game on 22 attempts per contest. Um, but I think his passing ability can certainly progress this season with what they have at pass catcher. You know, Daquan Felton was a big-time playmaker for them. Jalen Lane has proved to be a stout player. Did a great job at Middle Tennessee State. I was always a big fan of his when he was playing for the Blue Raiders. Had a big, I had a few big games for them. You want to also see him get more targets, though, a part of a potential heavier approach in this passing game. Unfortunately for them, though, you know, they experienced a big loss right away. Ali Jennings came over from Old Dominion. It was one of the best portal ads of last year's cycle. He had five grabs for 72 yards and two touchdowns against his former team in week one. Got hurt instantly in week two of an ankle injury. Didn't see the field the rest of the season. This is a big time player that's been completely forgotten about in circles, but one that can continue to make plays and has been highly productive in the past. So drones, again, only 22 attempts per game, well under 200 yards passing, Nick. But I think that's going to be a number that easily approaches 200. I think it's going to get north of that. And the balance here for Virginia Tech, pretty exciting. I think Drones has an untapped potential to develop his quarterback 2,000 yards passing, 17 touchdowns, three pick ratio. It's a fantastic ratio, in my opinion, right? 58% comp rate. You want to see that get a little bit higher, but he's the guy that has a really untapped potential. And obviously, the dual threat ability with 818 yards and the ground of five scores really does make him an all out threat and weapon for this offense with great balance. When you look at this receiving core, Ali Jennings, he's really the key, right? The two, two games he played before the injury, he had five catches for 72 yards and two scores. So he is a really talented player who has a lot of untapped potential, a great guy. They got out of the portal last year. Daquan Felton is another really uh, strong star player, 667 yards receiving and eight touchdowns for him. Jalen Rain, Lane, 538 and six scores for him as well. So there's a really nice amount of depth here. They have a great running back room, Malachi Thomas, who's a really solid back with, who can really, you know, he, he can score at times. Then a nice number two back there. And they have the lead back as well in Michelle Titan, who's a really solid back with 10 scores on the ground of five yards per carry. So this offense has great balance top to bottom. They can really hit you in a couple of different ways. If the offensive line can hold up and provide some good protection here for drones, this could, this offense could really be firing on all cylinders. That offensive line significantly improved last year. You know, they allowed much less sacks. The run game obviously improved like we envisioned. Sky seems to be a limit for them after another year under their belts. A unit that's really been an issue over the last couple of seasons. Not exactly sure the standouts are. We're going to watch some deeper film in the summer, and you know we'll certainly address this unit more in depth. I do know they added Montavious Cunningham, who's a really good right tackle. You know, nice pass blocker for Georgia State. Seems like this offense is gearing up for a major season. Twenty-nine and a half points per game last year ended up being that final total. But again, Nick, there's a lot of concern just because they were red hot, played Louisville, did absolutely nothing, and then instantly picked right back up the next week. And that's just not like what you like to see. I would have rather off seeing them do nothing the next week after they play Louisville Knicks, so showing that it's not just them struggling against tough opponents. They're struggling against everybody. But, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, they do great against these weaker opponents, but the tougher opponents they saw wasn't as special. They don't play them the next week, and they're red hot again. And that's really concerning, I would say. I'm definitely on board with you in that. I do share those same concerns. This team has a weird sort of streaky vibe at times where it feels like they're really hot. You know, we saw that at the end of the season when they looked great, when they rattled off two straight wins against Virginia and Tulane. But then you have that weird period where they, you know, struggled against Louisville, then lit up Boston College, then struggled against NC State. And, you know, obviously the bad streak of three losses to start the season at Purdue, Rutgers, and Marshall. You know, a bad loss at Marshall is one to look at. So this team has some weird streaks, right? They need to have a way to focus in the locker room and kind of get back down to the nitty gritty and be able to build up and keep those streaks of good uh, good form together and not have that weird uh, imbalance of play where you win some, you lose some, you win some, you lose some. That's certainly going to bother this team uh, continuously. Certainly think with added physicality up front and, you know, uh, you know, a rise in play from the passing attack, I think we'll certainly go a long way in doing that. Scored 40 plus points in the three, uh, you know, in the last three wins they had on the season. So I think they're certainly getting there. I think I'm very excited for the major season they could have. You know, looking at the defense, you know, Brent Pry, a defensive guru at Penn State, really expected the side to take more shape. And again, they were great in the games they won, but the consistency wasn't all that. They did improve in terms of yards per game allowed at 316, but the run defense was nowhere as polished as I figured it would be. You know, I really touted the depth I thought they had in the front seven. And, you know, they kind of have that yet again with more years under their belt. They do lose Fidelius Payne, who was a pleasant surprise for them. That's Trail Pollard and Mario Kendricks on the defensive front. And, you know, so they do have some really good players on the interior they lose. So this is, you know, a concern for this defense. Uh, Anais Pebbles comes over from Duke. You know, he was an immensely impactful defensive tackle for Mike Elko's defense. Um, but th when I talk about the defense struggling early on in the season, Nick, I was shocked how bad they were against the run. They gave up 180-plus in the first four games of the year. 
the opponent eclipsed the 200 yard mark three of those times. Um, you know, 282 against Florida State. Louisville had 231. Uh, you, you know, they held up very well against Boston College. Virginia, you know, they got absolutely stonewalled themselves. So, again, kind of like the offense, right? They do really good against these weaker opponents, against the tougher opponents, though. They're not very good. And you know, the month of September was tough for the run defense. Much better, you know, the second half of the year. Outside of the two teams that played in Charlotte, they got absolutely dominated against. You, you know, where, where are we at right now with this run defense? You know, they were not very good, like I thought they would be. Now they're losing some key contributors up front. This is certainly a tough uh, thing to kind of work back here with this team, losing some talented players. You would hope that they would have found a, a way to return some talented players, which is definitely going to hurt this team, losing some of that talent up front. Overall, though, this is a defense that has some good players that they can work with early on, some players they can plug in and figure out what they want to get. You know, I think this front part of this defense is going to see some new guys step up very quickly. Guys are going to have to find a way to get into this defense and really, you know, kind of get up there and work hard. A good leader for this team, you know, Cole Nelson, 13 games for him, 27 total tackles, seven and a half tackles lost, four and a half sacks. Some solid numbers from him there. I think he's a late, a guy that they can really rely on and lead on this defensive line. A guy that's really going to come off that right side of the edge with some nice speed, some good hand movement as well. A solid player top to bottom that I really like for this defense to return. It is a shame that they are losing so much talent. You know, there are some, there were some really talented players in the middle that you highlighted they're leaving. But I think when you have a guy like Nelson on that right side, a good senior leader. It's a nice, uh, you know, thing to return for your for your defense. Nelson was a strong tackler as an edge. Keyshawn Burgos, Josh Fuga, those guys are certainly have to step up. Biggest news for them is Antoine Powell Ryland. This guy coming over from Florida was elite. 14 and a half TFL, nine and a half sacks, three forced fumbles. This guy was as impactful as they come. Brent Pry, obviously at Penn State. I mean, the athletes they've had in their front seven over the years, it's just overwhelming, right? And Powell Ryland kind of reminds you. Uh, you know, from the impact he had last season. Getting him back is massive for this defense. They're up at 94 tackles for loss as a team last year. Obviously, he was leading the way. I think, you, you know, obviously with Payne leaving, who ended up having double-figure tackles for loss and some of these other defensive linemen, that hurts, right? And I think it's certainly going to make the job a little bit harder for Power Island in this run defense. But him being able to come off the edge and be, you know, strong and nasty, one of the best defensive ends in the conference, is certainly going to be something Pry is going to continue to try and hammer home on this defense. He's going to be a focal point this upcoming season, Nick. I think most people were kind of shocked the option to return, but he's back in Blacksburg, and I know they're very excited. Powell Ryland is an incredible player. He was at Florida. You know, there was some times where he was playing on the interior of the defense. They kind of kicked him to that, you know, outside of the edge, moved him around a little bit. They got a lot of great production on him, 40 tackles, 14 and a half tackles for loss, nine and a half sacks, plus three forced fumbles and three fumble recoveries. So really solid with the tackles there. He's a guy you want to have on your team. When I look at this left and right edge duo of him and Cole, uh, Cole Nelson, that's a really nice one-two punch coming you on both sides. I like him coming off that left side. I think he has great speed, nice burst. Returning him is really solid. You know, SEC experience at Florida. This is a guy that's a natural-born leader who fits in really well in this defense. Expect high production of him, You know, potentially pushing near that 20 tackles for loss number. He has a really good season. I think he can get the double-digit sacks this year. This is a guy that I expect big things out of this year. In the linebacking group, we'll have to have to, you know, to pick up a little bit of slack if the defensive line struggles early on. Alan Tisdale was pretty poor a season ago. Him and Keeley Lawson, you know, they're back, but they're really poor tacklers. They were one first and second on the team in terms of run defense support. Just weren't very great. Jaden McDonald, he was really impressive. You know, he should contend for a starting role, I would imagine. You know, there's plenty of versatility from Keontae Jenkins. You know, guys are certainly going to have bigger roles of the linebacking play does not pick up. I think it certainly will, though. You know, Brent Pry was a great linebacking coach at Penn State. You know, that's been his bread and butter for a number of years. Um, and I think last year, that's why I was so high on this linebacking group is because I thought they had some nice experience, and I love what they have in terms of coaching. And I think this might be the year they do it, and obviously we're going to continue to watch tape and we'll, you know, diverge our final thoughts in the summer. Um, but I think they're pretty happy where they're at in depth, and I think that the guys being able to be productive is certainly important. That's a nice step in the right direction. I think their play should certainly – take a leg up but if it doesn't Nick this run defense could get really worse and if that's going to be the case your season's going to be ruined I think this is certainly agree you know I think Keely Lawson's a good player to return yes he missed some tackles but 80 total tackles seven tackles for loss two and a half sacks six pass breakups good production there Tisdale another solid player who we need to see a little bit more out of 75 total tackles three and a half tackles for loss one and a half sacks for Tisdale and then Keontae Jenkins a really nice player 10 tackles for loss one and a half sacks 50 total tackles for him plus two forced fumbles and a pick so he's kind of a do-it-all sort of player nice way to move him around I think he's a good defensive leader to have another guy that's getting more experience as time goes on a good senior leader for this defense 
This front seven certainly has some question marks in the offseason. Can they improve on the tackling? Can they find guys to step up and replace those players who are missing? But overall, I like this defense a lot. I think this is a defense, certainly in this front seven, that has a ton of potential to grow. I've been a real fan of the secondary as well, but there are also a lot of untapped potential here. Only seven interceptions for this group after only four in 2022. Just not a playmaking defense at this point in terms of being able to create extra opportunities for the offense. At this point, they return to secondary, though, full of talented players. Uh, you look at guys like Dorian Strong coming off a big year. You know, just veteran safeties, Jalen Stroman and Azir Peoples. Mansoor Delane wasn't as great as he was two years ago, but this is still a player that has plenty of experience under his belt. And for the most part right now, this is a secondary that's full of experience. And obviously Jenkins, he's more of a versatile player as well. You might see him back there a little bit. Virginia Tech tied with Iowa for the fewest 30 plus yard passing plays allowed. This is a secondary that you only you know had opponents throw for 26 uh, attempts per game on them. So the numbers might be a little bit skewed, but this was a secondary that certainly showed up. Less than 170 yards per game allowed through the air. You know, I, I know against Purdue, it seemed like they're a bit of a liability. Um, you know, they had kind of some issues against Florida State, even though they weren't really a high volume passing attack. They didn't really face too many of those, Nick. And obviously, they're a bit of a liability on the ground, so why throw the ball? Um, but it seems like nobody really wanted to test them. 61% opponent completion rating is no joke, regardless of how many few attempts that opponents are throwing at you. Louisville, though, they did go for 92%, 12 of 13 on passing for 151 yards. Um, obviously, that comes with having a poor run defense where teams can just dump it off and utilize play action on you. I trust the secondary, though. They can get things right up front, limit opponents to a lot less yards per carry, not get grinded down on so much. I think the secondary could really ball out. I think the secondary has a ton of potential to grow. This is a unit that has some really talented players. I know they don't make a whole lot of plays. We, we highlight out the picks, but Dorian Strong is a great player for this defense. 25 total tackles, three picks, eight pass breakups. Really a big leader in terms of getting interceptions there. Returning him is fantastic. Playing him on the right side of corner. He's a guy that I think is an extremely exciting player to look at. Jalen Stroman, a good strong safety, 55 total tackles, two pass breakups. Has some weaknesses in pass coverage, but overall is a really solid tackler who I think can lead this defense. You know, this is a team that has some solid players in the secondary. They need to find a way to get some more interceptions, maybe play a little more aggressively on the back end. But they're good tacklers, you know, strong fundamentals in a, in a secondary unit that I really like watching. And now that's going to lead us to the schedule for Virginia Tech. Last year, I picked this team to win eight games. I thought they would clear that over five and a half with ease. This is a very easy schedule, Nick. Obviously, you have interesting contests on here. Play your rival at Old Dominion. See Rutgers in Marshall again. Um, you play at Stanford. That's going to be a long road trip. You do get the bye week afterwards, though. So if you can, you know, manage to get, you know, through the state of California undefeated, I think they can certainly finish off the second half of the year the same way. This is just not very tough, Nick. At Syracuse, that could always be interesting. You host Clemson. That's going to be a massive game. Obviously, you don't want to buy too much into the hype, but when you look at this at first glance, you're thinking, man, this team could probably go undefeated. Um, do you want to buy into the hype right now? Do you want to wait till the summer to make a final verdict? Probably going to be more likely. This is a team, I think, that has all the asset aspects to really compete in this conference and make the playoffs. I think when you have a one-two punch like Cutton and a quarterback like Drones, the receiving core is good. The offensive line has to get better, right? Biggest concern is that run defense, though. It doesn't matter who you're playing. If you can't stop the run, you're going to lose, Nick. It doesn't matter if it's Old Dominion or Clemson. You're going to lose football games. I think that's the biggest concern right now. But I think this is a team that can easily win eight to ten games. And if they don't, Brent Pry is going to have a lot of questions to answer. This team is certainly primed for some success throughout this season. The non-conference, I really don't think it's anything to worry about. You know, Vanderbilt, Old Dominion, those are two road games they should win. Marshall and Rutgers. I know both those teams beat them last year, but they get them now. At home, those are opportunities to win those games. I think they can certainly handle a you know, weaker Marshall team, a weaker Rutgers team. You know, At Miami, that's going to be a tough one, certainly. And then you, you alluded to that tough road trip out west to Stanford. They have a Thursday night game against Boston College. That's going to be a primetime game, certainly a game that a lot of eyes will be on, a game where you can get good stock on this team halfway through the season. At Syracuse, you know, that's an interesting game as well. Clemson at home, they do get the benefit of playing the Tigers at home. And like I said, when this team is good and when they're playing in those big marquee games, that stadium is as intimidating as any atmosphere in the country. It gets so loud in there. Sometimes we saw that a couple of years ago when they hosted UNC. 
to open the season and they beat you know a top ranked unc at home to kick off the year so certainly you know if things are going the right way for this virginia tech team clemson could certainly be on upset alert on november 9th and you close out the year with a trip to duke who are obviously you know replacing a coach and kind of transitioning and a virginia team that i think is continuing to be a mess to close out the season at home in, in their rivalry game this team could certainly you know push eight nine ten wins with the way this schedule is set up i think it's not too daunting you get it easy in my opinion with road games at stanford at syracuse at duke teams that i don't think are going to be phenomenal you know Sy syracuse is a wild card with their new coaching but outside of that, this is certainly a schedule that is favorable. A, a, a high-ranking bowl game should be the expectation for Virginia Tech this year. I think this will be a fun year overall for Virginia Tech. Will they make the playoffs? I don't know, Nick. But I think this is going to be one of those teams where they're intriguing to watch from week to week. At Miami, hosting Clemson, at Syracuse. A couple of games that are really going to pique my eye, especially there in November. It's going to be it for today's episode. As always, Nick, appreciate you joining me. Talking about a team that probably doesn't get enough love, but I think, uh, again, it's going to be a fun team to watch this year. Hoping and rooting for Brent Pry in 2024. Super excited for this team. I can't wait to watch them. You know, college football is better when the Hokies are good. Back in the day when they you know, had legendary coach Frank Beamer running the show, that was a team that I love to watch. I'm excited to see what Brent Pry and company can do this year.